It's great to see you here and um, in welcoming you I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We've got a, a real treat today and it's wonderful uh, for that treat to welcome back Professor Rick Shine. Rick, as you know, is, well, I suppose for many of us, he's very famous in his work on reptiles and reptiles and what they show about the Australian ecology. But as well as that, he's probably even more famous or infamous for his work on cane toads. And anyway, whichever, we all love hearing from him. And Rick, it's a great testament to you that we've got so many people here, but so many former present and former students of yours were very determined to come. Rick has a very distinguished career, has won pro numerous science prizes, national, international, various honours. And of course, last year, we were very proud that Rick was a scientist of the year for New South Wales. And of course, there are copycats around, and the Prime Minister was a bit of a copycat, and he awarded Rick, the Prime Minister's Prize for Science a few a month or so later, so he's allowed to do that too. And then um, Rick and his wonderful brother John had this idea that the Sydney Shines magazine ought to realise what they had on their hands. And for those of you who want to read more about Rick and John, in the most recent version of Sydney Shines, there is a truly wonderful article on the Shine Brothers, and we have a limited number of copies of this available for you as you leave. Um, it's a great read from brought out by Business Events Sydney. It hasn't been officially released, so guard your copies and don't send them around, but they're out there as a little present from us. And ladies, please now join me in welcoming Professor Rick Shine. He's going to talk about reptiles. So, uh, thanks very much, Mary, for that kind introduction, um, and thanks everybody for somehow finding your way here uh, so early in the morning uh, to hear me talk about one of my great passions, which is the conservation of uh, Australian reptiles. <coughs> so, I'm going to start with a, a very uncontroversial observation, uh, which is that Australia has a truly unique uh, flora and fauna. We have been separated so, for so long from the rest of the planet that we've evolved um, a really distinctive biota. And it was summed up very nicely by a young English biologist called Charles Darwin when he was visiting Australia in 1836. An unbeliever in everything beyond their own, his own reason might exclaim, surely two distinct creators must have been at work their object, however, has been the same, and certainly the end in each case is complete. So Darwin was well aware of just how incredibly different the Australian fauna and flora is from the rest of the planet. But that wildlife is under substantial threat. Many of the species that were around when Charlie Darwin was you know, climbing up Mount Wellington and heading off into the Blue Mountains are no longer with us. They've gone extinct. And if you go to Wikipedia, as we all do, uh, and look up extinct Australian animals, you'll find a list of 28 mammals, 24 birds, one reptile, and four frogs. Um, now, at first sight, that would seem to run strongly counter to the argument that I'm about to make to you, which is that Australian reptiles really need a lot more effort in terms of conservation. At the moment, Wikipedia is only giving us one victim compared to lots of mammals and birds. Is it really true that the wave of extinctions has primarily affected mammals and birds rather than reptiles? And I'm going to suggest to you that in fact the numbers are exceedingly rubbery and that Australian reptiles are in much worse condition than you might think. Um, the last authoritative analysis I could find from ABRS uh, in 2009 told us that about 20% of our mammals were threatened, about 6% of our birds, only 5% of our reptiles and so on. But this, this graph um, on the, the bottom here comes from 
uh, Hal Cogger's encyclopedic book on reptiles and amphibians of Australia. And it's gone through many editions. It first came out when I was a graduate student in 1975, uh, and uh, it, it's kept going. And the graph plots the number of species of Australian reptiles and amphibians that were covered in each volume of that book. So you can, you can see the, the increase has been truly dramatic. Um, if we were plotting the number of recognised species of Australian mammals or birds, that line would be fairly close to flat. People get excited if they, if they discover a new rat. But we've more than doubled the number of amphibians and reptiles recognised in Australia over the period that Hal Cogger has been, been writing that book. Um, I was at a reptile conference last week in Perth <clears throat> and in conversation one of the taxonomists said um, he needed to get around to describing more than 30 undescribed species in one genus of gecko that he had clear data for to show they were all distinctive and they deserved their own names but he hadn't quite got around to describing them yet. So we're still on the discovery phase. We know very little about how many reptiles and amphibians are out there and that makes it very hard for us to evaluate their conservation status. Inevitably, a lot of the new species that are being described are things that occur in very restricted areas and thus are probably very vulnerable to all kinds of, of pro processes. So despite the, um, what Wikipedia might tell you, I think there's a strong argument that our reptiles and amphibians are actually in some kind of trouble. Should we matter about that? Should we matter about the fact that even for some of these high profile <coughs> amphibians and reptiles, there's almost no detailed data about their biology? I think we should. And the reason that I think this is a problem is that reptiles and amphibians are incredibly important in ecosystem function, and that's probably more true in Australia than almost anywhere else on the planet. The issue is as follows. There are really, this just is not going to work for me. Anyway, I'm going to walk, stand over here. Um, Australian, okay, so there's, there's really two ways of making a living if you're a, um, a vertebrate. You can be an ectotherm, ecto from outside, you get your body temperature regulated by outside temperature. You can go and bask in the sun if you want to get hot. You can go and sit in the shade if you want to be cold. Ectothermy is incredibly energy efficient. Um, you don't need to spend energy with a high metabolic rate just to keep warm. The alternative, endothermy, endo from within, is what we do. Um, and that's maintaining your body temperature at a 37 degrees by chewing up huge amounts of energy and maintaining a high metabolic rate. Um, and so, I mean, I think we probably all know that, but, but maybe what you don't know is just how expensive that is. So that um, when, when Donald Trump there at, at the bottom is chewing through whatever nasty American food he's chewing through, 95% of the energy that he's consuming every day is being spent simply maintaining his body temperature at 37 degrees. So that in, a, in an environment that can support five kilograms of Donald Trump can support about a hundred kilograms of that land mullet that's, that's sitting there. So reptiles are enormously more efficient and because they have low metabolic rates they don't need constant feeding. They can sustain very long periods when there's no food around. And if you had to sum up Australia overall it would be that it's a warm place and there are plenty of times when there's no food around. Our soils are very infertile. We haven't had glacial activity or volcanic activity to push nutrients back up to the surface. Rainfall over most of the continent is very low and variable. And so that's the recipe for success for an ectotherm. Um, there's not a lot of food around. There are brief windows of opportunity, but you've got to wait out the bad times. And that's what snakes and lizards and frogs and turtles can do. Endotherms have to keep feeding. The fact that they're wasting all this energy keeping warm is not really a big benefit because it's pretty warm out there anyway. And their constant need for food makes it very hard for them when you get a drought and, and there's just no food and water. 
So in many Australian habitats, the reptiles and frogs are vastly more abundant than, than the endotherms. It really is a very hard place to be a, a warm-blooded animal. You know, we, we really shouldn't have kangaroos and emus on the coat of arms. It should be a black snake and a goanna. <laughs> so, so that's really my justification. Um, to say that the conservation of Australian reptiles matters because almost uniquely on the planet, our ecosystems depend for their function on what reptiles and amphibians are doing. They're not dominated by mammals and birds, uh, as in the, the recently post-glaciated lands of northern Europe and North America. So we need to find out what the heck cold-blooded species are doing and what we can do to, to keep them around. And so in this talk today, I'm going to actually go through three case histories, uh, two snakes and one lizard. Um, one of them is a case where it's an endangered species and so we've been motivated to look very much for solutions as well as to identify problems. Uh, the other couple of cases are more abundant taxa where really it's been trying to understand how climate change might have unexpected effects on the biology of our, our study systems. So I'm going to take you on a romp through these three examples. The first one is the endangered species. And this is a local animal, the broad-headed snake, Hophlecephalus bungaroides. Um, quite a small snake, very colourful, um, highly venomous, uh, related to tiger snakes and copperheads. The broadhead has the very unfortunate distinction of being only found in the Sydney area. It's a specialist on the sandstone habitats that occur within 100 kilometres or so of Sydney extending a little further south. And the reason that that's important is that those crevices under those sandstone rocks offer really distinct thermal habitats. If you're an ectotherm relying on outside temperature to regulate your temperature, it really matters what temperature you've got access to. And if you're, if, in most of these sandstone outcrops, a rock is not going to be particularly warm because it's going to be shaded by trees. But if you've got a steep cliff and the trees can't get to the top of that cliff, so it's open and exposed to the sun, then the rocks right on that cliff edge can get an extreme exposure to sunlight and they get really warm. So that if you were to look at, at one of these rocks on a, on a, 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 getting the afternoon sun, you'd discover that the top of that rock is actually quite hot, almost painful to touch. But if you turn the rock over and put your hand on the substrate, it'd be quite cool because it's been shaded. And so a, a snake or a lizard sitting inside the crevice under that rock can push its body up against the top rock and maybe get to 38 degrees. Or it can push its, its belly down against the, the, the bottom and get to maybe 20 degrees. So you've got this sort of air-conditioned basement and a heated uh, upper floor and it means that a snake can live in there for months at a time, just moving subtly a centimetre or two and maintaining exactly the temperature it needs. That's a phenomenal opportunity, and as a result, the rocks are really popular real estate with reptiles. And most of them come from lineages that normally occur in much warmer regions further north. They, they, they function at high temperature, but because there's these little pockets of almost tropical conditions under these very special rocks, that, those lineages have been able to penetrate down into the cooler regions around Sydney. And that's why the broad-headed snake occurs only in those areas. It relies on those um, habitats. And the lizard on the, the bottom right there, the velvet gecko, is the primary prey, especially for juvenile uh, broadheads. So broadheads were once probably the most common snake in Sydney. Uh, the first book on Australian snakes was written by Gerard Kreft in 1869. And he said that broadheads were common in Randwick, Bondi and Coogee. Uh, they haven't been in those areas for a hell of a long time. And Kreft, even in 1869, could work out one of the reasons that the snake was disappearing. Um, people find those lovely, thin, flat sandstone rocks very attractive, and they like to have them in their backyards as ornaments. And so the rock outcrops were being plundered. These thin rocks that were exposed to the sun were being removed, 
It takes thousands of years for one of these rocks to reform. It's, it's just cycles of shrinking and expanding and, uh, in sunlight over the days. So they're essentially irreplaceable. And once they're gone, the snake has nowhere to live. And so broadheads have disappeared from most of their range and they're now officially classified as, as endangered. We only know one small area near Nara where they're still common. Everywhere else they're basically gone or very rare. They still turn up occasionally. I found this uh, newspaper clipping from 1964. A gentleman in Piermont was lo loading wood at a factory when he, he saw uh, a snake's tail sticking out and he grabbed it and uh, it bit him um, and he passed out shortly thereafter just to demonstrate that these are indeed highly venomous snakes. But uh, this, as far as I know, this is the last broadhead that turned up in suburban Sydney. Now, look, at first sight, it's kind of a puzzle as to why broadheads have gone. OK, Sydney has been modified, but there's plenty of bushland around. There's plenty of sandstone outcrops. Why is the broadhead continuing to decline? And the answer to that question comes from a guy called John O. Webb, who was a student of mine, did his PhD on broadheads, uh, John has since gone to the University of Technology, Sydney. He's still working on broadheads. Uh, it's now uh, something like a 30-year study, and it's one of the most uh, probably well-known snakes in the world. And what John o tried to do was to find out what the hell the problem is. And the really obvious problem is that rock thieves are coming into national parks and they're um, grabbing rocks and they're putting them on the backs of trucks and they're taking them away to sell. Um, the rocks are protected, you're not allowed to do it, but if you don't have a job but you've got a ute, uh, it's a pretty easy thing to do if you can find somebody that'll buy the rocks off you. So that is continuing and it's spreading closer and closer to the last stronghold of, of the broadheads. So what can you do about that? Um, the main thing we did that was constructive is we talked to the National Parks and Wildlife Service rangers who, who run the show there and convinced them that this was really a big deal and that this was the last population of broadheads in their care. And they were terrific. They really got going. Uh, they put up signs uh, reminding people about bush rock removal prohibition. They put up cameras. Um, we, had broad, we had rock collection listed as a threatening process. Um, the rangers managed to put up gates, locked gates, uh, on the main access road that would allow people to come in and steal rocks from that last remaining population. So it was pretty straightforward. It required um, a bit of communication between scientists and managers and some courage from the, um, uh, the managers because some community groups oppose it uh, vociferously, but it didn't require a lot of money. Um, just to underline the commitment that was required, uh, the managers uh, put up these beautiful gates um, and, and these beautiful signs, and what happened is that uh, people would come and spray paint over the signs, and the four-wheel drive enthusiasts would uh, come and rip the gates off their hinges, and they would uh, uh, boast on the, uh, the online blogs about how they were ensuring freedom of access for all Australians and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, there are some real community issues there and the, the National Parks uh, staff tell us that you just have to keep going and keep talking to people and uh, that broadhead population is still intact, despite the fact that 20 years ago I really thought that, that it was desperately imperiled. But I lay awake at night wondering what would happen if a couple of guys with a ute turned up and cleared out the rocks from the last known population of broadhead snakes? What could we do? Would it be possible to replace those rocks? If we had that technology, then suddenly it's, it's a far more manageable problem. And so Ben Croak did his PhD on this. Um, he looked in great detail at the rocks that were being used by snakes compared to ones nearby that weren't being used, tried to work out what it was about a rock that made it attractive, um, exposure to the sun, the size of the rock, its thickness, crevice dimensions and so on, and set out to try to design an artificial rock. Um, we had to measure crevice structure, so we um, took rocks and we put um, expandable foam underneath them and we put the rock back down, we let the foam set and then we could get very detailed casts of what the rocks were like, how thick the crevices were, 
Uh, we designed sort of the ultimate holiday apartment for broad-headed snakes. We made a thousand of them uh, and we deployed them. It turned out to be absolutely critical that they fit perfectly to the substrate. Um, and so we used this um, uh, rubber to, to create that form. It turned out that bigger openings uh, made the rocks um, unusable. So there was a lot of mucking about um, and we did a lot of science with it as well, looking at habitat selection questions. But the end result is that we had a thousand rocks um, spread out over the areas where broadheads occurred and where they once occurred, but the rocks had been destroyed and we hoped there were still a few snakes left. Um, they were very rapidly colonised. This is Ben playing with a diamond python that turned up. Um, the invertebrates, uh, like flat rock spiders, came in very quickly. The lizards came in a bit later. And when autumn came and the broad-headed snakes moved back from the forest to the rock outcrops, sure enough, they turned up as well. Uh, this is David Pike, who also did a PhD on the system. Um, and we began to find lots and lots of broad-headed snakes under our um, fake rocks. Uh, the velvet gecko, the critical prey item, also used those fake rocks. And um, a gecko basically sort of wanders off from where it's born and it finds a rock and it lives there the rest of its life. And so we could compare the ecology of geckos living under a fake rock to the ecology of geckos living under proper rocks nearby. And in fact, the guys under our fake rocks were surviving better, growing faster. They really were terrific real estate. So that kind of means that I don't have to lie awake at night worrying about this, even if the last stronghold is destroyed and the habitat is wrecked, and it can be done in a weekend by a couple of guys, we, we are able to go back in there and keep that population going. But that's not the only threat. Um, it turns out that the world has changed for the broad-headed snake. These are aerial photos of the study area taken in 1941 and again in 2007. And the light lines are the clifftops. So these are pretty much the only place in a dense eucalypt forest where the sun hits the rocks. And you can see that those bare open areas have almost disappeared. The forest has got much thicker. We don't really know why. Uh, Aboriginal people going off the land and the cessation of frequent burning may have been the reason. Uh, foxes wiped out the rock wallabies. Maybe they were preventing trees from growing up on those cliff tops. But whatever, it's very clear that the bush has got thicker. We took very detailed data on uh, sun exposure, we had little da data loggers, we could measure temperatures of inside crevices, and it becomes very clear that overgrowth is catastrophic for the broad-headed snake. Um, so in this case, these were actually rocks that were used consistently by a couple of broadheads this tree grew up and the, and the snake simply abandoned those rocks. The obvious thing to do is to cut the trees down so that the sun hits the rocks, but it's difficult, it's politically sensitive. Uh, the green movement in Australia, uh, one of its great triumphs was the Save the Forest campaign. People don't like the idea of going into a national park with a chainsaw. Uh, they think trees are good and obviously there are issues with, with carbon storage and so on. But we're talking about a tiny manipulation, a tiny area to keep an endangered species going, um, having almost no effect on the broader habitat. I was impressed that the managers allowed us to do this, um, not in the National Park itself, but in an adjacent area. And so we hired a guy with a chainsaw who used it like a, a virtuoso uses a Stradivarius violin. And this guy roared through and in a day and a half, he knocked down about 50 trees that were shading the critical outcrops. And sure enough, the, the, the lizards came back, the snakes came back, it worked like a charm. So we know how to do it. Um, there's no need for formal policy changes here. It's all about local people doing things at a local level. They're pretty inexpensive, they take effort, but community groups and managers are happy to put that in. Whether or not we want to start chainsawing bits of national park, that's an issue for a forest policy. That's an issue, that's a broader debate that, that I don't want to get into. But we have the tools. We have a simple toolbox. We know what's threatening broad-headed snakes. We know things we can do that will 
resolve those problems. So my second study is about climate change and sex. And so first of all, a quick tutorial on how an individual sex is determined. Um, all of the males in the audience here have got an X chromosome and a Y chromosome in every nucleus. All of the females have got two copies of the X chromosome. Um, reptiles are a little bit more sophisticated. There are some systems where the male has two copies of the same chromosome and the female has one of each. Um, and that's called a ZZZW system. But strangely, in many reptiles, including all crocodilians, many turtles, many lizards, there's no genetic difference between a male and a female. Your sex determ is determined by the temperature that you experience when you're an embryo. So if the nest is hot, you'll hatch into a boy. If the nest is cold, you'll hatch into a girl, or vice versa. Very, very straightforward, very, very widespread. This can happen even in species that where the female holds the eggs inside a uterus until they complete development, they're live bearers. So these little Tasmanian skinks, um, mum retains those developing eggs inside her oviduct. It's very cold on the soil, so it, that pays off. But despite the fact that she can buffer the effect and she can choose to go and bask or not, um, in a hot year, most of her offspring are gonna be daughters and in a cold year, most of her offspring are gonna be sons. So this starts to kind of get, make you feel a little bit nervous about climate change. If the sex ratio is shifting from year to year based on temperatures, it doesn't need too much change in climate to start mucking around with the sex ratio in the population. But the species that I've worked on is a, a far more complex beast. It's a skink that lives up in the highlands in the Brindabella Range at the, uh, the border of ACT in New South Wales, 1,100 metres or so. The landscape is so cold that these egg-laying lizards need a, a sunny spot to lay their eggs, and so they, they come out to these hydro cuts, these places where the forest has been cut down to put the electric power lines through. That makes it ludicrously convenient for a biologist. I just turn up in the first week of December, start walking along these open areas, turn over logs and rocks. I can find hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of freshly laid eggs. I can take those eggs back to the lab, incubate them under various conditions, ask all sorts of questions, and then as soon as the, the kids are born and ready to go, we can take them back to the Brindabellas and let them go again. So it's, it's low impact research as well. So the, the lizard has perfectly good sex chromosomes. It's XX, XY, just like people are. So if you look at chromosome pair seven on the top picture, uh, it's a female with XX, chromosome pair seven on the male is XY. So these guys are going to have 50-50 sex ratios regardless of the temperature at which their eggs incubate. But several years into the project, I actually went back and looked at our data, and despite the fact that they have perfectly good sex chromosomes, it's also absolutely clear that the sex ratio of their offspring shifts with incubation temperature. If you incubate the eggs warm, you get mostly daughters, if you incubate the eggs cold, you get mostly sons. How can that possibly be? We have a genetic sex marker and we can show that what's happening is that temperature overrides the sex chromosome. So that in, at, in the low temperatures, um, you know, 15, 16, 17 degrees, many of the genetic females actually grow up as males. Very peculiar, very confused lizards. There was another pattern in the data which was that small eggs tended to give us sons and large eggs tend to give us daughters. And so with a, a colleague, Raju Radha, we actually took those newly laid eggs and we stuck a needle in them and we sucked yolk out to miniaturize the hatchling. And sure enough, those miniaturized eggs develop as males. So whether that lizard is a male or a female, is a complex interaction between the sex chromosomes it carries, the incubation temperature of its nest, and how much yolk and yolk hormone mum managed to put into the egg. So it's vastly more sophisticated than anything that, that mammals do. So how does that relate to climate change? Well, we've been me measuring nest temperatures in the Brindabellas for so long 
that we can actually answer that question. Um, this is a, a plot of air temperature during the, the summer season against um, the month of the year, the week of the year. And the bottom line and the, the blue uh, dots and so forth are for the first 10 years of our work in the Brindabellas. Uh, it was pretty cool. The lizards laid in sort of mid-late December. The red line is for the second decade of our work in the Brindabellas, and we had a whole succession of hot years. Um, so the ambient temperatures were higher. The lizards responded by laying quite a bit earlier, but even so, the temperatures were quite a bit hotter inside their nests. And that difference was enough to switch them from a temperature-dependent sex determining system to a genetic sex determining system. So we actually changed the way that lizards determine their sex simply from a one degree or so change in average summer temperatures. Lizards can compensate to some degree, but it seems that the system nonetheless is changing. And very briefly, we work with Arthur Georges and his crew at the University of Canberra on these bearded dragons, which are they, they show the reverse story um, to the highland skinks. This is a dragon living in the desert where it's hot. This is a system, ZZZW, the, the female is the, is the sex with the two different types of sex chromosomes. In this system, if you incubate eggs at very high temperatures, the genetic males turn into females. And there is evidence that this is happening. The surveys are picking up more and more of these sex-reversed female dragons. So these guys have got male genetics, but they have female bodies. They, they produce eggs and, and so forth. And we did some work to show that, in fact, these are very peculiar lizards because that male genetics seems to be manifested in their brains. They act like males. They're bolshy. They're aggressive. They beat up other lizards. They're bullies. They like high temperature. But yet, they are perfectly functional females. And as a result, in the lab, they produce about twice as many eggs per year as a normal female a concordant female. So these guys can take over very quickly. We can lose the female sex chromosome from the population in a single generation. Their kids are all, um, their sex is determined by incubation temperature alone because there are no sex chromosomes left because we've only got males out there even though some of them are females. So we're turning into a very complicated world um, and you have to understand the biology in order to understand some of the differences, that, uh, some of the changes that uh, climate change will invoke. So my last example is um, a tropical one. Um, many of you will have visited uh, Kakadu and driven between Kakadu and Darwin. About halfway between the two, there's a place called Fog Dam that's been the centre of much of my research activity for Oh, longer than I care to admit. Um, this map shows the location. This is Fog Dam up here, Sydney down here. Um, it's a very long way, but the Australian Research Council has been kind enough to give me the funding to enable me to zip backwards and forwards on a regular basis and to have people based there. Um, we have the, the bottom picture shows the, the wall of the dam with the, the dam on one side and the floodplain on the other. Uh, it's a wet season, so the floodplain's underwater, but it's, it's dry most of the year. And the picture on the left is a, uh, a dinner party we threw for the buffalo farmers and a very large olive python turned up to say hello. It's a wonderful place. This is just to demonstrate uh, the accuracy of my statement that I've been doing research there for more years than I care to admit. Um, <laughs> This, this is actually me. So, you know, in those days, um, my, my beard was black and I was picking up king brown snakes. Um, these days, my beard is white and I restrict myself to water pythons. But <laughs> the, the work has continued um, in, in great detail for a very long period of time. Um, in terms of the climate, as many of you would know, basically it's always hot. In Darwin, uh, the average daily temperature Maximum is over 30 degrees in every month of the year. But the rainfall is highly seasonal. So there's a brief wet season when the monsoon rains transform the landscape. And we go from a, uh, a series of uh, separate billabongs through to a, a very widely connected floodplain when the rains come. And of course, this is heaven for reptiles. Um, you know, it's hot and wet and there's lots of food. 
So the three species that we know the most about <coughs> are this is a, a small, harmless water snake called the keelback. It eats primarily frogs. This is uh, the Arafurophile snake, belonging to a, a really weird group of snakes, entirely aquatic, eats nothing but fish. And this is the water python, uh, which is a specialist on native rats. All three of those species are very common in the area. and. In the early 80s, when I started working there, I was really struck by the fact that the world changes depending on what the wet season was like the year before. After a good wet season, the floodplain stays moist and it's green and, you know, it, it's a luxuriant place for, for most of the dry. But after a poor wet season, the place dries out very, very quickly and turns into a desert. And to briefly summarise, what we found after that 25 odd years of detailed work is that we can identify really strong links between climatic variation and the ecology of the predators. It doesn't matter how much it rains early in the wet season because that rain just goes down into the ocean. But the rain that comes late in the wet season keeps the floodplain damp. That gives the frogs lots of time to breed and lots of bugs to eat, gives the fish lots of shallow water to spawn in, it gives the rats lots of green food. And so the numbers of frogs and fish and rats are vastly higher after a good wet season than after a poor wet season. And as you might expect, the predators that depend on those prey are highly sensitive to that variation. And so as a result, we, can, we have strong quantitative relationships. If you tell me how much rain we got at Fog Dam last wet season, I can tell you what the survival rates, the growth rates, the reproductive output of all of those snake species will be. It's really, really consistent. Um, I didn't start this project to look at climate change. I didn't know about climate change when I started it. I was just asking a biological question. But clearly, this is exactly the sort of information we would want. We could potentially predict exactly what's going to happen to this system with predicted changes in rainfall in the tropics. So can we do that? And in fact, I was actually thinking long and hard about applying for a grant to hire a modeler to do this and fortunately I never got round to it because it turned out that it would have been completely futile. The reason it became futile was that on the 7th of March 2007, 50 kilometres upstream from our study area, there was incredibly heavy rain, one day of incredibly heavy rain. And this huge tidal wave of water came down the Adelaide River it hit high tide on the Adelaide floodplain and the water got pushed over and it completely filled up our floodplain. And that had never happened before. I mean, it's, it's damp, but there's always chunks of dry land. And on that one day, all of the rats drowned. And there were the bodies of wallabies lying around and so forth. So it was absolutely catastrophic. So if we look at the numbers of rats in our transects, they're quite short transects, just about 30 traps. In most years we catch, you know, 60 to 100 rats and those numbers varied between the years and that was very tightly linked to rainfall in the preceding wet season and it was all very nice. And then you'll see that in 2007 the number of rats we caught dropped almost to zero and the same was true the next two years. That red bar on the far right side is BH, that's Beatrice Hill. That's a, that's a small hill that's just a couple of kilometres away. But it's high enough that it's, it was out of the flood water. And that was the number of rats we got in our transects there. So it wasn't that the, na these native rats had disappeared from across the landscape. They had disappeared at Fog Dam, but they were still very common up on the hill. The pythons, the water pythons that eat the rats, were in big trouble. Their body condition, and that's just a, sort of the ratio of mass to, to body length, had varied a lot over the years. There were years when the, rats, when the pythons were pretty thin, but after the 2007 tsunami, the pythons were starving, and they were essentially skin and bone. And you'd see snakes just lying out there in the damn wall with their, with their ribs poking out through their skin, pretty much. And they began to die. Now these are very mobile animals. Every year they, they migrate several kilometres down the floodplain to get the rats um, that are pushed out by some of the floodwaters. 
but they went the wrong way. Uh, there were no rats down there. There were rats quite close by. Again, the red bar shows Beatrice Hill. The pythons there were fat. There were plenty of rats. But the pythons didn't know what to do, and so they stayed at Fog Dam and they starved. And so we found these emaciated snakes. This one's actually trying to eat a roadkill snake, which is incredibly unwater python-like. But they, they, they were starving. So it does look as if you can have very long data sets on the relationship between climate and population viability, and you can start to feel really confident. You understand this system. 25 years of data, and then one day's rain, 50 kilometres away, completely smashes it. And, of course, the predictions from climate change are that extreme events are going to become more common. And I suspect even a few extreme events are probably going to have more impact than a lot of these more subtle changes in average values that we tend to, to, to talk about most of the time. Um, ask any insurance assessor about extreme events and how frequent they've been over the last few years. Uh, the water pythons would agree with the insurance assessors. So even though ectothermia enables you to survive the bad times, there are limits, and the poor old pythons hit those limits. So that's really the end of the story. Um, the, the critical messages that I want to get across are to say that in Australia, the cold-blooded vertebrates are critical components of ecosystem function, and unfortunately, we don't know much about them. Many of them are in trouble. And to understand exactly why they're in trouble and what we can do about it, we do need ecological research on the unpopular wildlife, as well as our furry and feathery friends. Thank you. Thanks, Rick, for a, a really wonderful talk. We'll all be able to manage dinner parties now for weeks with those great stories, as long as we're not all at the same dinner parties. Um, I imagine there's a million questions. We've got time for a few. So who's got the first question? I, I'm going to ask one first. With the artificial rocks, should you be making lots and lots of them, and should we all be buying them and putting them in our backyards to get the snakes back into the city? Maybe that's a rhetorical question. Uh, uh, no, look, I think, I think the general approach is, is going to work. So, for example, there's a, 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 an endangered species called the pygmy blue tongue in the grasslands of South Australia. They're putting pipes in the ground to mimic spider burrows, and this endangered lizard is using them well. So the lizards don't seem to, and the snakes don't seem to care too much about the exact detail. They're after things like, like temperature profiles. So it, we should be thinking about habitat. I think mm. it's education more than anything. Right, yeah. All right. Mike. There's a microphone coming for you. Um, Mike Giroux from the Warren Centre. Um, I live in the northern suburbs and we have noticed uh, uh, quite an increase in water dragons. Is there a reason for this? Is it the backyard pools or what? <laughs> Yeah, look, it's a strange phenomenon that there are winners and losers with, with any environmental change, and that the water dragons and water skinks are, are spectacular winners um, in, in Australia. Um, there's, a, there's some recent evidence showing that all of these little suburban populations are actually isolated and they're evolving different body shapes and, and, and a whole bunch of different behaviours. So there's, there's, there's sort of a Galapagos experiment in process in the suburbs of Sydney and Brisbane with the water dragon populations. I think they're just... Um, they're big and bold, and they seem to be able to put up with us, and they're very flexible. Um, we've worked quite a bit on them, and I'd be happy to talk with you about their bizarre social lives, but um, I don't think I have a, a meaningful answer. Donald. Uh, Donald Peck, the Royal Society of New South Wales. Um, just going to your two aerial photographs of the, rain, of the forest in the 1940s and forest in 2007, some years ago I looked at the rainfall data from, for Sydney that started in about the 1850s and up to date, and there were two clear phenomena. One was the year-to-year -year variability that we all know about, but the other was that there was a long-term variability that appears to be maybe a 100-year cycle or more. And what was clear was that from the 1920s through to about 1950, there was a decline in rainfall in the, in the Sydney region. And we all know about the Warragamba crisis and why we call mm. Warragamba Dam. But at about the time of your first photograph, it was a very dry period. It then increased quite substantially and came back up 
I can't think exactly how much, but it was maybe 50 or 70 percent. So your 2007 photograph is a much wetter period. My question is, when you've got such limited data on this, how do you make sure that the decisions that you're making, for example, cutting trees down, is the right decision when maybe it's just natural long-term variability? Yeah, look, I absolutely agree that long-term climatic variability is critical. We did have um, aerial photos from many intervening periods as well, and, and including some from later than 2007. Um, and my understanding from the, the GIS guys that looked at it, it was that they, they didn't believe it was, it was precipitation driven, but you, you may well be right. I, th I guess my own answer to the, the bigger question about how do you make decisions in the face of uncertainty is that you involve the community, you involve the managers, you're looking for low risk alternatives. The sort of things that we're talking about doing are not going to imperil the forests of southeastern Australia. Uh, we're not going to release a genetically engineered tree killer, you know. Um, so I just think you've, you've got to be modest. You've got to recognise, look, you know, there are competing issues and, yeah, on balance, guys, the broadheads have been dropping for a few years now. Let's, let's be prepared to take out one-tenth of one percent of that forest in order to keep that species going until we can maybe come up with better solutions. Oh, lots of questions. Mark. Thanks, Rick. Cool case studies. Can I get you to enlarge a bit on the process of the recolonisation of rats into the lowlands from Beatrice Hill, for instance? And, and, well, I guess maybe there's a more general question in there about the widespreadness of extreme events, I suppose. Yeah, so look, this, this, is a, this, this was a demoralising result. Um, the rats, uh, Rattus fuscopes, a native rat, it's a plague rat. So this is one of these things that famously, especially in the desert, erupts in vast numbers and then almost disappears. So th this is something that you'd think would be a quick recovery species. They, they mature at a couple of months of age, they have 10 kids, they, you know, they can generate vast numbers of baby rats. But on the, on the floodplain, when they were eliminated, they simply didn't seem to have any recruitment areas nearby and Malomus, which is a, a smaller rat, actually started to appear in some numbers, but nothing like the original ones had appeared. Um, nobody has looked at movement patterns much, but certainly we catch the same rats in the same traps every time. Um, the adult male rats seem to move around a bit more than everybody else, and they get hammered by the pythons. But I don't think we know the natural history of the, of the rats well enough to, to predict exactly what that spatial extent will be. Uh, the pythons, though, were desperately disappointing. This is a mobile top predator that traditionally every year moves several kilometres to a, 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 a food supply that moves in space, and yet the damn things weren't prepared to go in the other direction. And so even a species that I would have guessed would be so flexible that it could deal with this sort of problem actually fell over. Oh, yes, all right, there, and then, then Peter Tyree here, yes. Hi, Judith Smith, UTS. You said we're still in the discovery phase for Australian reptiles. So how much work do we need to do to know what we don't know, and who should be doing that work? <laughs> my my um, taxonomy-focused uh, friends would be taking you out to dinner and thanking you desperately for asking that question. Um, <laughs> Look, I mean, we're in the area of, of molecular genetics and, and species discovery, and, and we're roaring along. There are, there are groups that are doing it damn well. I th my impression, looking from a distance, is that it is difficult to get money for the classic alpha taxonomy. You've got to dress it up into biogeographic questions and things like that. There's people like Craig Moritz at ANU that are, are managing to do extraordinarily ambitious large-scale sampling and, and so forth. Um, I just think that as biologists who are assessing each other's grant proposals, we need to recognise the value of knowing what the hell is out there before we can understand what it's doing. And I guess we need to be talking to groups like this saying, hey, look, don't overestimate our knowledge of the Australian fauna. The reality is we are in kindergarten. We do not know how many species of reptiles and amphibians live in Australia, let alone which ones are under threat. And I think that's probably the most important message. Good, great question.
Yeah, thank you. A very enjoyable morning, Mary, of course, and the rest for your presentation. I don't mean to be provocative with my question, uh, but it joins, <laughs> it joins uh, science with, with uh, your work, and that is these days we genetically modify things. So is there any scope for a lot of work in genetic engineering uh, to look at these states and other things and say, so, well, we, we maybe could just tweak this aspect or that mm. aspect and, and then we've got uh, uh, no endangerment. Yeah, I mean, these are incredibly complex systems and um, you'd really, to keep populations of predators around, you've got to have populations of prey. I think you've probably got to have the appropriate habitats. Um, at some point you would change the species you're trying to conserve so much that it's no longer the same species. I was talking to Mary just before the talk, in fact. I, I think we are moving into a world with, with CRISPR and gene drive technologies where there will be quite technically feasible opportunities to do some pretty remarkable things. Whether or not we want to do that, I don't know. I'm very skeptical about the dangers associated with some of the genetic modification methods. So I think we have to make sure that the solution is better than the problem. And uh, there, are, there are issues here that I think require very wide consultation before we move on. I, I make the cheeky comment, Darwin saw this in the 1800s, this evolution. Yeah, I can I easily believe that. He was an extraordinary man. Yeah. One last question. Oh, sorry, Kate. Maybe we'll have two. <laughs> I um, start a question from the Natural Resources Commission. Um, why are warmer climates and temperatures more suitable for female gene expression? Yeah, there's, there's actually a, an enormous range of temperature dependent sex determining mechanisms and in some of them, for example, you get boys in the middle range of temperatures and, and girls in the high temperatures and the low temperatures and so on. Uh, in the cases where it's been worked on uh, and worked out in detail, it usually turns out that there's something magical about developing at particular temperatures. So that, for example, in some lizards, an egg that's incubated at an, at an intermediate temperature gives you a terrific boy, but a not terribly good girl. And an egg that's incubated at extreme temperatures gives you a damn good girl, but not a terrific boy. And so an egg may essentially work out what temperature it's going to experience and, and turn into the sex that is best able to use those incubation conditions. Um, but it's, look, it's a complex story. Uh, there's a bunch of different arguments out there as to how it works, and we're still very much at the, at the, at the beginnings of, of really teasing it apart, I think. Another great question. And Kate, you can be the very last question. Well, the opposite is environment and heritage, which includes national parks. So there's about to be um, three large-scale ecosystem engineering projects established in New South Wales national parks focus on the reintroduction of those well-studied, adorable mammals that are locally extinct. <laughs> what opportunities do you see for doing something similar, either actually study, reintroducing some reptiles or studying the role of reptiles in that ecosystem, in those ecosystems? <laughs> Yeah, look, I guess I, I would call for a very broad system-wide approach to these, these issues, you know. I think we are going to have to get out there and create heterogeneity. There are some habitats that will work with some species and not for others. And the sensible way for managers to go is to prevent monoculture, to create this diverse range of environments. We need to look very much at all of the components that are being affected. Um, my colleagues that work on invertebrates would uh, be hating me for never mentioning a bug, but there's a heck of a lot of them out there. So yeah, look, let, let's step back and pull in all the expertise we have and ask ourselves what are the, what are the plausible impacts across the board and could we tweak these things to, make, to create a better situation? Thank you. And Rick, thank you very much for a wonderful talk and for all you do for the snakes and lizards of Australia and New South Wales in particular. As many of you know, I strongly support New South Wales snakes and we'll be supporting them for the opening of Science Week again when Princess and I will open Science Week at the Australian Museum. Um, Princess is a snake. Um, <laughs> there's, so Rick, uh, just before a couple of other announcements, can I say thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you very much.